As good as this looks right here, how good does this look up here? Man, isn't that awesome? And this is just a few of the ones we took to Pigeon Forge. I think we loaded about 14,000 young people in a bus, and uh, two buses in a van, and we headed to the mountains, and God uh, showed up in a mighty way. And uh, we're going to hear uh, from a video here in just a few moments, just some testimonies from some of our young people, and probably next week we'll do another video with some more of our young people just testifying about what God did in their hearts. But today you are in for a treat because they're going to sing one of the songs that we learned uh, at the conference, and uh, I promise you it's not just their voices that you're going to hear, but you're going to see it come uh, out of their heart as well. Thank the Lord for God using and already moving in the next generation. Amen, church? Thank you for being here. Welcome to New Life. I want us to pray, and I want us to ask God's blessing on this service. We desire God to do something incredible in our midst today, and so let's beg him to do that. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for being here already. We sense your presence. God, the 9 o'clock service, we were so challenged from Brother Stephen's message, and Lord, so excited about what you are doing in Irvine, California. But, Lord, we're excited about what you're doing here. And, and I just praise you today because you're at work. And we want you to be at work in this service. And so, God, would you right now, would you use every aspect of this service to draw our attention to you? God, minister to our needs. We worship and we praise you because you are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
that's the decision they made uh, this week. That, Lord, wherever you have us to go, whatever you lead us to do, our answer is yes. Amen? How many going to pray for these kids? Amen? We want to show you this testimony video as they go down. So I pray it will minister to your heart. It was a joy this past week to take our young people to the Youth of Flame Conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And we asked several of our young people to give a testimony today just to share with you, our church family, what God did in their hearts. We're so thankful for what God is doing in our young people right now. And I do believe the Youth of Flame served as a shot in the arm uh, for this incredible group of young people that I think is going to shake a generation for the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many things I could share from Youth of Flame 2021. I'm in awe of how God worked in my life and many other teens. I enjoy Youth of Flame every year because it's nice to be around other teenagers that have the same fire for God that I have. This year at Youth of Flame 2021, um, Wednesday night, Jeff Jones preached on living a pointless life and basically what he was talking about was not fully living your life to what God's will was planning on for you to do. And that night I committed to following whatever God had planned for me in the future. God spoke to my heart this year at Youth of Flame. Every message spoke to me, even Pastor Scott's. No, but seriously, he did a great job. He preached on finding God's purpose for your life. I'm so glad I got to go to Youth of Flame this year and make so many great memories. I'm so glad I had the chance to go to Youth of Flame this year. Um, all the messages spoke to me in a specific way. One phrase that spoke to me throughout the whole conference was, don't waste your life. Um, so I've decided this year that I'm not gonna waste my life on earthly things, but to focus on the opportunities that God has given me this year. God convicted me from a sermon preached by Dr. Curtis Linton called, Lord, I hurt so bad it's hard to hear you. He said that we get to this point of knowing that we need God, knowing we need to see him and hear him, but we can't see past our problems, our pains, our addictions, whatever is in front of us. And I find myself doing this so much. As Christians, we're not promised a perfect, pain-free life. There's going to be suffering, but that suffering comes with a purpose, and it's important how we respond. So God convicted me to make sure I put Him between me and my problems, rather than my problems between me and Him. Um, I committed to putting God between me and my problems to where I grow so close to Him and I seek Him that I can't see around Him. I can't see my problems. All I see is Him. So this past Wednesday marked the date last year that I fully gave myself to the Lord. Giving myself to the Lord was the best decision that I ever made. I gave up my fear of what God had planned for me because I've known for a long time that He was calling me into ministry. Ever since that Wednesday night, sitting in the auditorium, talking about giving myself up to the Lord, He has opened so many doors in my life. So this past Wednesday at Youth of Flame, I recommitted my life to whatever God has planned for me just to say yes because all I need in my life is Him. All of the messages at Youth of Flame, God spoke to me, but our last morning service was the one that really stuck with me. Jeff Jones was speaking on how to really live the Christian life and stick to our decisions that we previously made. He spoke on how if you read your Bible systematically, God will change your life. And I realized I'd read my Bible more this past year than I ever have, and God really has changed my life. So seeing God not only working, but working in my life was really great. This year at Youth of Flame, the Lord really challenged me to grow through my circumstances rather than just getting through them. The Lord puts every circumstance in my life for a specific purpose, and my job is to rejoice in Him and grow through that. The message that spoke to me the most was from Pastor Scott titled, Why Not Me? We talked about having a commitment to do whatever God wants you to do and following through with it. Don't do your own thing. Do what God wants you to do. This year at Youth of Flame, I was challenged to rejoice in the Lord's victories and blessings, specifically in one of the sermons where the Lord moved and our Christian family ended up increasing with about 40 more brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord also challenged me to not expect to wake up one day and be in the center of His will. Pushing to be in the Lord's will is a process that has to be nurtured over time, and the time to start is now. I want to thank our church for helping fund our teenagers to go to Youth of Flame this year. It does make a big difference in our lives. 
Thank you for helping our youth group go to Youth the Flame. A conference like Youth the Flame really starts a fire in young people's hearts. Youth the Flame really affects my life. I know it affects all of my friends' lives as well. And so I really feel like teenagers should be going to this event. If you're a teenager that goes to New Life, you definitely need to make plans to go next year because God will definitely do something special in your life. I want to encourage every teenager to go ahead and make plans to be at Youth of Flame next year. Please pray for our youth group because the Lord is doing something special in our lives. We desire to see the Lord start a revival at New Life Church, but we want it to start with our youth group. Again, thank you to New Life Church. Thank you to all of the sponsors that went. You guys were incredible. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do in the days ahead uh, through this group of young people because of what he started at Youth of Flame. God is doing something very special with our kids. And... Uh, Christian and I were wore slam out. We got back Thursday night. I slept to this morning. <laughs> this is a special group of teenagers. We've been on a lot of trips and we traveled the roads with a bunch of kids. I'm not sure that I've ever been with a group that from the very beginning, they just wanted to hear from the Lord. The truth is, they refreshed my spirit. They challenged me to get home and get in the Word and to keep being faithful, to keep living steadfast because I want to do that for them. I don't want to let them down. There is a revival that is brewing and it has been brewing in our kids for some time. And I have to admit what I told him. I said, look, I want you to go back to Newburn and I want you to see all them old dead people revive too. I was talking about you. <laughs> but if we're going to take this next generation back, it's going to be through what God does in them. How many would commit today to our young people they can, they can depend on us to be praying for them. Every day, God, use these kids, these young men, these young women, to do a mighty work for you. Would you pray for them? How many? And I believe God's going to do it. I can't wait to see. And I want to keep being a part. I told him in our testimony time on Wednesday, when God speaks to our heart, it's a privilege. We don't deserve it. But every time the Holy Spirit speaks to us, what an opportunity to hear from God. A God who we've already sung about this morning who is, who is worthy of our praise. And a God today who we know sent His Son into a world to live a sinless life, to die on an old rugged cross for the sin of all mankind so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is a God who is worthy of our praise today. Amen. Would you stand with us and we're going to worship again together as we sing one of our favorite songs. It's a song about truth. It's a song about salvation. It's a song about the gospel. The title of this song is, Oh, Praise the Name. Let's sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his 
sends his feet, my Savior, that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in about it. God is so good. Amen. 
He's so worthy of our praise. He's worthy of everything. And um, I think God's doing something special in our hearts already, using these teenagers to, to challenge us and to speak to us. And I pray today that we would surrender ourselves to him because he is worthy. He is worthy of our lives. May we give ourselves to him right now and forever, each and every day, living our lives and living sacrifice for our God and our King. Would you bow for prayer with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done in our hearts already today. Lord, you are moving in our midst. You're moving upon your people. And Lord, you desire to do such a great, marvelous, powerful, and radical work in our lives. But Lord, we need to set our hearts aright, put ourselves in a place where we can completely hear your voice. Lord, you're speaking to us. May we open our ears to you. Your word is pure, your word is true, and it is clear for us. So may we follow your word, and may you change us by your word. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Amen, church. Man, if Brother Stephen wasn't here, I'd just go ahead and dismiss you. I believe we already had church. Thanks a lot, bud, for being here. <laughs> uh, it, it is a joy. It is a joy to have Brother Stephen and Miss Lauren and Lily Kate and Ainsley and Carter are with us today. Uh, if you didn't notice, uh, Lily Kate was in the choir with us. Uh, the Lord gave us just the privilege of, of having her last week. Uh, she flew across the country. From Los Angeles to Raleigh, by herself. Glory to God. And uh, and got here, her granddaddy, Brother Henry, picked her up. We were able to get her on Sunday afternoon. Last Sunday afternoon, she spent the week with us. And uh, what a blessing uh, it was to, to just be with, with her and have her with our teenagers and to see her and KK back together, the bands back together and and, uh, and then last night, to be able to spend time with, with Stephen and Lauren, uh, it reminded me of several things I shared at the 9 o'clock service. Number one, how much I love them, how much we love them, uh, how proud we are of them. Uh, God is, God's doing some great things, as Brother Stephen's going to talk about in Irvine. And, and we at New Life Church get to be a small part of that, and man, we rejoice in that. And then spending time with them just reminds us how much we miss them. We, we want to cherish every moment we can uh, with him. And again, he's such a great preacher. He served here for seven years. Um, w one of the best staff members that we've ever had. He, he was always there for his preacher. He was always uh, challenging his preacher in so many good ways. We, we dreamed together, went to the mission field together, uh, did some skits together. I thought about playing some of those videos, but I thought if the Spirit of God was here, it would quench him immediately. And so uh, maybe we can send you some YouTube links, but uh, it, it is our, our joy to, to just introduce our partner in ministry, uh, pastor of the Grace City Church in Irvine, California, uh, my fellow laborer and my friend, Brother Stephen Kimball. Let's give him a new life welcome. So you said one of the best staff members. I want to know where I rank. What, what number? <laughs> Who's above me? What do I got to do to get to the top? Um, and it's good to be here with you all. Um, I, I love seeing those videos from the teenagers and seeing them up here in the, the choir singing. Uh, we just give them another round of applause for that. That's, that's awesome. I, I worked with, uh, with the teenagers for seven years while I was here, and I, I love seeing teenagers just come back from stuff like that on fire for God. And, uh, Man, just hearts that are moldable, and, you know, I think, you know, sometimes we hear that and think, oh, that's sweet, but, man, they're making life-changing decisions. Uh, I made life-changing decisions at camps like that, and uh, that are still bearing fruit today, and so never discount what God does in a young person's heart, 
And uh, I think, I think too, I think we should give a round of applause to those sponsors that went on that trip. Can we, those adults. Um, yeah, I remember, I think it was after, I don't know, my second or third Youth of Flame, and I got back and uh, got off the van, and you know, after that drive and, and three hours of sleep every night, and uh, a parent came up to me and said, how was your vacation? <laughs> and I punched him in the face, and uh, <laughs> they no longer attend this church. <laughs> that was true beside the punching part. Uh, so, yeah, Scott, how was your vacation? I <laughs> hope you enjoyed it. Should be good for another year, right? Uh, man, not a vacation, but uh, a, a lot of fun, a lot of good times. We, we still talk about the memories we made here on on trips with the teenagers. It was good to see some of them this morning and, and catch up. Good to see some of you in the audience today. And uh, man, some of the best times of our life were here. All of our kids were born here. And uh, man, just so many good memories. This feels like home. This You feel like family to us. And, and uh, it's never long enough to just swoop in and catch up and you know a few moments in the, in the foyer there. But uh, we really do. We, we love you. And, um, and we, we feel loved when we come here. We feel energized when we leave. And, uh, you know, wish it could be more. You know, there's been a lot that's happened over the last two years. I don't know if you guys had a pandemic out here. Uh, but we had a small one in California. And, uh, and things have been different out there, too, in the past year and a half. But uh, it's so good to be here with you. Uh, we just we can't say enough how much we love you, uh, how much we appreciate you. And, and there's been so many of you that have been supporting us over these last few years financially and with your prayers and text messages and uh, Facebook messages. And I want you to know, those mean a lot to us. They really do. They mean a lot uh, to just, man, to know that you have people back here praying for you. Um, it's not like that for every church planner. I talk to a lot of church planners in the area where we're at, and they say, well, you guys, you got, there's people back home that, like, are praying for you and supporting. Yeah, yeah. Man, I don't have any of that. Yeah, there's a lot of people doing that. And it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And so it, it's good to be here with you. Uh, I want to take a few moments today and, and uh, just catch up, you know, just catch up on, on what God's been doing, what's been going on, uh, the ups, the downs, um, and, and just share some of those with you the next few minutes in the service and share some stories. And then I'll close it out uh, with a, kind of a, a, shorter, a shorter message. I know we're a little short on time today, but I do want to speak to you from God's Word in just a minute. Um, but I think a lot has happened in the past year and a half, to say the least. A lot's changed in our world. And, um, you know, just painting a picture leading up to that time. So we, we moved there in 2015, started the church in 2016 in Irvine, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with us, and um, got off to a great start. And, you know, I remember after the first two and a half years, people would ask me, you know, what's been the hardest thing you faced? And I'd say, well, you know, moving here, going through difficulties like that. Um, but man, as from a church aspect, honestly, things just went about as good as they could go. We got off to a great start. Church started growing. Um, people were getting saved. Right before the pandemic, we were averaging close to 200 people every week. I mean, it's just like, Lord, what in the world could slow this down? And um, I remember in February of 2020, I was uh, working out at the gym and I know that's obvious, you didn't have to, I didn't have to tell you that. Uh, much like some of you, the workouts kind of halted during the pandemic, and uh, you know, the eating workout picked up, and anyway. But, um, so I was working out, the, the news was on this big screen TV, and they were talking about the stock market. And just, the stock market was just up and to the right at that point. And after the guy gave a report about the stock market, the other guy, the anchor, looked at him and said, what in the world could stop this market? Do you see anything in the foreseeable future that could slow this down? And he said, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I don't see anything on the radar that could slow this down at all. And I remember sitting there and thinking, you know, I think he's right. I don't see anything that slows down the stock market. I don't see anything that slows down this economy. I don't see anything that slows down our church. Man, the, things are just going great. And then, you know, a, a couple weeks after that, we start hearing rumors of this virus. Uh, COVID-19. Anybody heard of that this year? Okay. Um, and of course, we know, man, the stock market comes to a screeching halt, the economy, things locked down, and, and, um, and everything else that has ensued over the past year and a half. 
And I told a, uh, a group of people, a board in California that supports us, I was reporting to them, and I said, I feel like that's kind of how it was with our, our church. Um, and don't take that in a bad way. Our church is still going. I'll get to some good stuff in a minute. But you all know, things got difficult. Um, we went online in March, and we were online from March until August of 2020. Um, we tried to find ways to meet, but there's just it was not a possibility uh, where we were to meet. We started off, uh, we met in a school. Um, originally, is where we started out in school, and there was absolutely no way a school or any other facility was going to open their doors to us. And so we started petitioning uh, the city, the school district, for give us a field, you know, give us somewhere that we can meet in. We'll spread out. We'll wear a mask. We'll do all these things. And uh, finally, finally, in August of last year, they agreed to allow us to have a field to meet in. And so little by little, people start trickling back to the field, you know, coming outdoors. And, uh, and so that's, that's where we've been uh, since then. We've been outside in a field for, what's this, 10, almost 11 months now. Our church is, uh, let's see, what time is it, 8.30 there. Uh, we've got people that are setting up right now, a, a stage and, and getting re the band ready and getting sound up right now. Uh, they're setting up to have church in, in the middle of a soccer field uh, beside an elementary school. And so that's where we've been uh, for the last year and a half. And uh, there's, been some, uh, there's been some real highs I'll talk to you about in a second, and there's been some real lows. Uh, it's crazy. We've seen the past six months, we've seen our lowest attended day ever and our highest attended day ever. How many of you feel like that's what COVID-19 has felt like, right? Just a roller coaster of all the good and the bad intertwined. And it's been a, a crazy, crazy year to say the least. We faced a political, uh, political crisis, uh, a racial crisis, an economic crisis. Uh, we had wildfires. That's one thing we have on y'all that y'all didn't have. Uh, we had wildfires uh, that, that almost took our city out. And I mean, honestly, it was a miracle. The wind shifted right at the last moment. And, and uh, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but, but God spared us in that. And, uh, and then, of course, we had a worldwide pandemic. And living in a state with uh, some fairly strict restrictions. First one to close down, amen, last one to open up. And so that's, that's where we've been over the last over the last year. So to sum up 2020, uh, 2020 was a long and difficult year for our church and ministry. Um, but like I was telling the first service, one of the things God has really taught me, um, my wife knows this, like I want everything to always be up and to the right. Like, you know, winning, let's just win, right? Let's just win all the time. And one thing God has taught me in this last year is he doesn't need everything to be going perfect for him to still do his work. And that's in our church, that's in our life. He doesn't need everything to always be easy street for him to still be doing what he wants to do. Um, Jesus, I think, said it best that he would build his church and even the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, you think about all that we faced in the last year, year and a half, all those things. We haven't seen many of those things in the last 25 years or even 100 years. And yet in one year we see all of those and many of those things were, were difficult for churches and yet God's church still prevails. And so I want to tell you, uh, I want to tell you some of the good stories, the things that God is continuing to do at Grace City Church in Irvine. Um, if you guys have that, that first picture, uh, you can throw it on the screen there. Um, these are my neighbors. Uh, this is Jenny and her family. Um, they moved to Irvine. Some of you may remember the story I told. Uh, they had just moved to Irvine, I think, last time I was here. Uh, they moved to Irvine from Vietnam uh, several years ago and uh, moved in across the street from us. And our church was, in the summer times, we do a challenge called Summer Challenge. We challenge people to know God and know their neighbor. We give them ways to do both. And we give, one of the things we do is we, we give them a, a welcome box. It's just full of all kinds of little treats and goodies and gift cards and things. And we tell them, take this home, put this in your closet. When, a neighbor, when you have a new neighbor this summer, get it out, take it over to them, say, welcome to the community, and tell them, I got a great church, you should come with me. And, and so we did that. I feel like as a pastor, I should probably obey and do that too. And so we took that box home, and uh, we had new neighbors that moved in from Vietnam. And if I'm just being completely honest with you, my, just in the human level, my first thoughts were, hey, they probably don't want to talk to us. You know how it is, you know? And uh, my kids said, Dad, we got to get the box. We got to take the box to them. 
And so we, we take the box over. My kids come with me. We take the box to this family, and we begin a relationship with them through that. We gave them our phone numbers. They would text us from time to time. I mean, they're in a new country. They have no clue about some of the things in the area. Ask us questions. And so we build a relationship. Um, and then, um, then they began asking questions about our church and started coming to our church just a few months before the pandemic. The mom spoke very little English. The kids were, were fluent in English and Vietnamese, and, and they would come. And uh, what was cool, I didn't tell the first service this, but the mom asked me to start sending her my sermons ahead of time. So I would email them to her. Early, she was the first one that got to read my sermon every week. And, uh, and she would translate it. And while I was going, you know, while I was preaching, she would be reading through the translation. And uh, then the pandemic hit, and so they started following online on Facebook. And uh, she would comment, and that was neat to see that they were still involved. And um, she also, um, oh, excuse me, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, so it was a few months into the pandemic, she reached out to me and said, uh, Pastor, uh, my family is ready to follow Jesus. And I was like, wait, who? Follow who? And she said, we're ready to follow Jesus. And in my, thought, my mind, I thought, hey, I don't know if she fully understands what that means. I mean, honestly, in our area, sometimes you see this where people, they just want to fit into American culture. And they're like, I think Christianity is a good American thing, so I'll do that. And so I said, well, let me come by your house. And let me just walk over. Let's talk about it. And so I, I brought Lily Kate with me. That was a Sunday evening. And sat down in their house. And, uh, you know, just to give you an idea of where they had been just a few months before, I'd been over their house. They wanted me to come bless their home, to pray over it. Um, really kind of just a, a superstitious thing, really. And I went to pray over their home, and, and I said, well, let's pray. And they all stood there and looked at me. And I said, oh, they, 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 and she said, the kids have never prayed before. Okay, well, this is how we pray. And we talked about how we pray. And so now I'm back again, and, and, um, and she said, yeah, we're ready to follow Jesus. And I talked with her, and I just want to make sure she understood what it meant. I said, now listen, it's you know, he died on the cross, and for your sin, you understand, yep, yep, and he resurrected, yep, and, and you realize this is not, we're not just praying a prayer for good luck, and we're not just, you know, just praying this prayer, and, and we get a ticket to heaven, we're asking, we're saying, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you, and I'm going to obey you with my life, I, I fully understand, and I'm fully ready to do that, like, wow, I was like, okay, and she's like, oh, not just me, everybody, I'm like, everybody, the kids too, the kids too, so now I'm like, well, hang on, let me, your mom can't make that decision for you, what about you, and I, I go through each and every one of them, and every one of them that day bowed their head, received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. And, and, and so keep praying for Jenny and her family. Uh, I'll show you a, another picture here. This one is, uh, this, is, uh, this is our setup, okay? This is where we have church, uh, out in the soccer field. You can see the banner there, and that's our, our makeshift stage. This is actually taken on Easter. This was... Uh, Easter was our biggest service ever. Uh, we had uh, 368 people um, at Easter in a, in a soccer field. And that's not supposed to happen, right? And, and it happened, and God did that. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, we're not running that every Sunday. You guys understand what happens on Easter. Uh, but that was an awesome, awesome Sunday. Um, and then if you'll go to this next slide, this happened just a few weeks ago. Uh, one of our goals in moving there was that we wouldn't just start one church, but that we would see churches multiplied. We'll, we'll make disciples and make disciples, and we'll start churches that start churches. How many of you think that's a pretty good idea? Um, and so our goal was to do that within five years. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the guy that moved with me, uh, that was our family pastor, came to me and said, I think I'm supposed to be that guy. Um, had a burden for an area called Chula Vista. It was about an hour and a half south of us. It was near Mexico, a uh, growing city, about 200,000 people and said, I think that's where God wants us to go. And we prayed about it. We said, we're in. We got behind it, challenged our church to give uh, and support them. And, um, and, and, and right now, our, our, our brand new church, just through the individuals, are supporting $2,500 a month. Is that crazy? It's a brand new church plant. I was hoping he'd get $300 a month. He texted me after service and said, 25. I kind of wanted a rebate on that so our church could get a little more. No. <laughs> but, man, that's just that's what God does, right? Uh, when people get the gospel and they realize what it means to them, they say, I want somebody else to get this. And, uh, and God is uh, doing amazing things. They just moved there a month ago. They have a team uh, that's there helping them as well. And, um, and so, uh, man, that's in a pandemic uh, that God could plant another church. That's crazy. Uh, but that's, that's what, going back to that, what Jesus said, the gates of hell can't prevail against it, right? And so we had the opportunity to pray over them just a few Sundays ago and uh, commission them to go. And our church is pumped about that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, I'll tell you, some of you, some of you know this family. This is Jasper and his wife, Ivy. 
And um, you remember their story from before. Jasper um, and his wife moved from China about three years ago. Uh, Jasper was an atheist. His wife was a Christian. But her church in China had been shut down uh, by the government. And so she said, the first Sunday we're in America, we're going to church. And so um, they lived in our community, so they came to our church. And Jasper uh, didn't want anything to do with church. Uh, he was an atheist, so he just went and sat in the nursery. And he did that for months, and finally he got curious, and he came and sat in the service. He told me since then, he said, Pastor, the only reason I came in is, he says, because I knew you were brainwashing people. And he said, I wanted to find out what your tricks were. <laughs> okay. And so he came in, and... Uh, Long, long story short, Jasper wrestled with the gospel for many months, uh, but long story short, he got brainwashed, amen? And uh, so you'll see the next picture um, of Jasper. This is after he was brainwashed, and now a follower of Jesus, and uh, man, just an awesome guy. I'd love to bring him here one day and just let you guys meet him. One of the, one of the funniest and just uh, down-to-earth guys you'll ever meet, but just brilliant, understands fully English and, and Chinese and both cultures, just a, a unique guy. And, uh, but the story didn't stop there. You know, and I love that. Like, that's, the story doesn't stop at baptism, does it? That's just getting started. It's just getting started. That's when you become a disciple and you start growing. And he started growing like crazy. And, um, and as he grew, he began to serve at our church. And then just a few months before the pandemic started, he came to me and said, Pastor, you know, I teach uh, English as a second language. Um, I've got a degree in that. What if I did that for the church? We have so many people in our area. I think it could be a ministry to them. And I could share the gospel while we did that. And I said, well, that's a fantastic idea. Let's do it. So we started it. We did it on Sundays. Like during our second service, we would have an English class that met um, in another room. And uh, then, of course, the pandemic comes and um, it shuts down. But there was a lady uh, named Catherine that started coming to this. She was from China as well. And she came to learn English, started coming to the church. Pandemic comes. She's, they start meeting online through Zoom, and she does it that way. Um, but then one of the teachers in this group, his uh, name's Mark. And uh, Mark uh, is as American as you get, uh, but Mark reached out to Catherine and, and started discipling her, just doing Bible study through the book of John with Catherine. She, she had never been through the book of John in her life. And uh, much, through much of the pandemic were, were them on Zoom uh, and him going through explaining the book of John to her. And um, just, just a, a few months ago, she reached out to him. He, he said he left her kind of with the decision. You've got to make a decision whether you're going to follow Jesus or not. And she reached out to him via text one day and said, Mark, I just want to let you know that God got a new daughter, is how she said it. And she said, I'm in the family of God now. This, this is her. This is Mark. Mark's in the orange. Um, it, the picture is stretched a little bit, but he is a big dude. And he, he wouldn't mind me saying that. And, you know, I, I told the first service what I love about this picture is they could not be more polar opposite in, in the way they look and the way they think. Uh, Mark grew up in a rural area of Northern California and uh, is just, he is as conservative as you could be. He's, he's a gun-toting uh, uh, American. I, you almost call him redneck. Uh, he's uh, all of those things. Uh, and, and Catherine is none of those things. Um, completely different background, right? Not, the world looks at that and says they have absolutely nothing in common. And yet Mark saw an opportunity to share the gospel. That's what he did. And so when, when we baptize, um, I, I love to get the person that led them to the Lord or was influential in them coming to Christ in there with them. And so we tell their story, and that's what we did that day. And, and uh, Mark helped me uh, baptize Catherine on that day. And what's cool is, uh, I, you can't make this stuff up, right after the service, I told Lauren, I got a text from Mark. And, and he said, hey, Catherine wants to start tithing. And I said, amen. And so, uh, but no, he said, she wants to start tithing. Can you help her know how to, you know, get online and do that? And, you know, we joke about that, but that's just a young disciple taking another step in their relationship with Jesus. And so um, I share these things this morning to update you, but I, I want you to see and I want you to know, um, I want you to know your investment. And a lot of you have invested in us. You've prayed for us. You've financially invested and, um, and, and I want you to see the return on your investment. Um, you know, I started uh, really playing in the stock market. I think a lot of us did in the last year and a half. I had nothing else to do and got a Robin Hood account, right? And, and so I started doing that. And one of the things that I love seeing is that, you know, when you invest right, you don't only get your money returned, but you get an investment on that return. Or you get a return on that investment, right? You get to see it multiply. You get to see it grow. Uh, but what's even better than that is in the kingdom of God. And I love that, you know, to be able to come back and say, 
hey, look, you invested in one church. There's two now. That's pretty cool. And, and already hear that church say, hey, within five years, we're, we're going to plant another church. Man, to see that continue all over the state of California is, is pretty exciting. And, and to see people like Jasper and Catherine and that multiplication continue to happen. It's going to continue to happen. And, uh, you know, people like Jasper, they tell me anytime I come back, they know I'm going to visit and see churches that are supporting us and have supported us. But Jasper always says, hey, make sure they know. Make sure they know how much I appreciate them. And he, he says, let them know this Chinese guy in California knows Jesus because of them. I texted him before the service and said, hey, uh, just a second ago I said, hey, I'm about to preach at a church in North Carolina. Anything you want me to say to him? He said, awesome. I'd like to say thank you for their support. For helping me come to the Lord. And now allow me Sorry. For allowing me to lead my family to Jesus. And now teach others through the ESL ministry, the English class, to spread the gospel to more people. None of those things would have happened if it were not for their investment in the kingdom of God. So, I told the first service, I don't like being emotional. So we're going to move on. Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. My wife knows I don't get emotional about a lot, especially in public. But when you know people's lives and eternities have been changed, it's hard not to. So thank you for your investment. All right, moving along. You know, um, one of the things I've, I've come to understand over this last year and a half is um, I think all of us have been living in a reality that, to say the least, has been unclear, right? Um, you know, I, I don't envy anybody that's in leadership, whether it's a church or a job or government trying to make a decision or a family. For that case, it's, it's been hard to lead in a time where you didn't know what direction to go, right? You know, what step to take, what route to take. And um, it seems like there's a million different voices out there telling us what to do. You hop on social media, check your email, talk to your mama, somebody else. There's a million voices. There's a million paths that we could take. There's a million fears out there. And... Things have become unclear. When you have too many options, too many choices, you just lose focus, don't you? And, um, and that's difficult. And, um, but So I want to talk to you just for the next few moments about how to gain clarity in an unclear reality. And I know we're emerging from this pandemic, and it feels like maybe things are getting more clear, but then there's still a lot of questions we have about our country, maybe our city, and even our own lives. And I, I want to take just a few moments and uh, talk to you through what God has been teaching me over this last year about finding clarity when everything's unclear. Um, I think so many times our tendency is to try to clear it up, right? Let me just figure it out. If I can get enough data, if I can talk to the right person, if I can just figure out the right step to take, then I'll be clear. And that's not really how it works. It's not how it works. I, I want to talk to you from... Um, the passages are from Leviticus, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. And um, I, I spent a lot of time in those over the pandemic, and I just I felt like there was so much wisdom to gain from that. You've got a group of people that have been led out miraculously from this land of bondage, and they are going to a promised land. But getting out of bondage was the easy part, right? And getting all of those people to where they need to be. That was the difficult part. And there was a lot of times where it was unclear. There was a lot of times where they didn't know what direction to go. And there's a lot of times it, it just, it was overwhelming. And so how does, how does a man like Moses, 
How does he take a group of a million people that are being bombarded by a million different opinions from every direction, and how does he lead them from where they are to where they need to be? And I believe it's because of the clarity that he had from some habits that he built. And I want to talk to you about those just for a few minutes. And so here are the, the tips that I found from Moses and his adventure through the wilderness. Number one, in a world of a million p- opinions, know there is only one truth to believe. I want to say that again. In a world of a million opinions, there's only one truth to believe. Moses had led a million people out of captivity. But how many of you know a million people had a million opinions? Everybody knew what direction they should go, what direction they should not go, what they should eat, what they should not eat, how they should act. And every single one of them verbalized their opinion. How many of you realize over this past year and a half, there's a lot of people with a spiritual gift of verbalizing their opinion? And most of it happened on social media, didn't it? They didn't have social media, but they didn't need it because they all lived together in this one huge group of people and they verbalized their opinions to each other and they verbalized their opinion to Moses and it didn't take long. They had just left Egypt and they were just on their path a couple days out of Egypt and Pharaoh starts pursuing them and all of a sudden the whole crowd turned on Moses, didn't they? All of a sudden, they get under a little bit of pressure, and these opinions start coming out. And in chapter 14 of Exodus, in verse 11, it says, And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Does anybody sense the sarcasm there? You had to bring us all the way out here, Moses, to die? No graves? No, not a grave there? It's, yeah, it's like a great spot to die. Why hast thou dealt thus with us? To carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not the word, is this not the word that we told thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? This is that we told you so. Moses, we told you this was going to happen. You came to us, all these great ideas, and God spoke to you from a bush and said, You're going to lead us out. And we told you, No, we're not going out. And you did all these miracles, and, and now here we are. And we told you so. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses, we've been better off dead than to be all the way out here. You know what they're doing? They're sharing their opinions. They're taking their truth and putting it on Moses, aren't they? Say, Moses, this is true. Moses, this is true. We should have never come. We should have stayed there. We told you so. This is true, Moses. You believe the lie, and you let us out here, but what we're telling you is truth. And Moses had to deal with this over and over again. And a big part of Moses, don't miss this, it wasn't just a physical journey of leading people across the desert. The bigger part was the mental journey. Moses had to decipher what truth was, didn't he? When a million people were telling him what truth was, Moses had to decide. And he couldn't figure it out even in his own mind. I'm sure he thought to himself, I don't know, maybe we are going in the wrong direction. I don't know, maybe you should have never done this. Maybe I had too much to eat the night I saw the fire in the, in, the, you know, in the bush. Maybe it's just, maybe I was wrong. But Moses, even though he didn't always know what truth was, he didn't always know what to do. As a great leader, when he lacked clarity, Moses had a habit. He had a habit that he did that brought clarity into his life. Look in verse 15. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why criest thou to me? Speak to the children of Israel, that they may go forward, but lift up the rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground in the midst of the sea. What was his habit there? God tells us because he says, Moses, stop crying out to me, okay? So what was Moses doing? He's going to God. Through the, his simple habit was that Moses consistently went to God as his source of truth. And through this simple habit, he was able to tune out the noise of a million opinions and hear the truth from God. Has anybody noticed that truth is hard to come by today? Our media outlets present everything as truth, and yet, by the way, it's typically a spin on truth that, that slants to your political side, however they can make money off you. I hope you realize that. Our social media platforms are full of rumors, fake news, conspiracy theories. Our culture attempts to redefine the clear realities such as gender and marriage constantly promoting new theories as truth. And with all of this attack on truth coming from so many different directions, this is why Proverbs says this, buy the truth, Proverbs 23, 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. What's this mean? It means the truth is so 
important and valuable. If you got to pay for it, work for it, whatever you do, find the truth and hang on to it. The reality is we have the same options as Moses. In our day and time today, we can believe the loudest voice. We can listen to the popular opinion. We can believe what's easily accessible. Just click on the internet and find our truth. Or we can build the habit into our life of going to a proven source, which is God's truth. The word that has not changed for 2,000 years and doesn't change with the times. John 17 in verse 17, Jesus said this of his disciples, Sanctify them with what? Thy truth. Thy word is truth. So number one, in the world of a million opinions, there's one truth to believe. Number two, how do we narrow it down and bring clarity? In a world of a million fears, there's one shelter to run to. You know, we're not the first people to deal with fears. Do you know that? Fear's been around for a long time. 365 times in the Bible it says, fear not. It's one for every day of the year. Fear not. Why? Because fear is a human problem. And they face fear. They ran out of water. They ran out of food. They faced hostile armies. They were bitten by snakes. All of these things brought about fear in them. They faced problem after problem. Their natural response was fear. And how many of you know that fear can show itself in a lot of different ways? had many faces for them. Some of them were paralyzed by it. Moses, let's just stop right here. Or Moses, let's go back. Some were angry. Moses, you're an idiot. Some of them fought for control. Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days. They were afraid, so what do they do? Hey, Aaron, you're in charge now. We'll tell you what to do. Sometimes they complain. What were all these things? It was just fear and the different ways that it manifests itself. So my question to you is, how, how are you manifesting your fear. Over the last year and a half, how have you been showing? What's the face of fear that you put on? Maybe for you, it is anger. And that's why you get on the, behind that keyboard, right, and let everybody in the world know what you think about them on Facebook. Anybody do that? Anybody want to point to their spouse? Mm -hmm. Boy, that happened a lot this year, didn't it? You know what's at the heart of that, I believe? A lot of fear. A lot of fear. Maybe for you, it's not anger, it's complaining. Just hop on the phone and Talk about somebody. Let them know what you think about them. Maybe for you it's just be paralyzed. You just stop dead in your tracks. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. There's a lot of different ways that we try to deal with fear. A lot of different masks of fear that we put on. But going back to Moses, I love to see the habit that he put in anytime he was afraid. What does Moses do? Those moments that bring fear. And you've got to ask yourself, well, was Moses afraid? Absolutely he was afraid. He was human. It's a human problem. Fear's a reality. But you know what he does every single time? He runs to his shelter. In the land of a million fears, there was one shelter, and that was God. At the Red Sea, everybody's like, Moses, what are we going to do? He goes to God. They run out of food. What does he do? He goes to God. They run out of water. What does he do? He goes to God. There's an enemy marching on them. What does he do? He goes to God. When everybody else is walking around wearing their different masks of fear, Moses is running to God. And it wasn't because he wasn't afraid. He just knew where to go when he was afraid. And that's what makes all the difference in our life. My challenge to you is some of you are trying to get over these fears. You're trying, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. But how many of you realize when you don't want to be afraid, you just become afraid? It's like our kids, when they, they, you know, they have a, a scary dream. They're like, don't be afraid. Okay, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It, it just makes it worse. But the reality is that you don't stop to process by saying, okay, I'm not going to put on my mask of fear. I'm not going to put on my mask of fear. No, you just go to the right place when that fear, that mask of fear comes on you. And here's, my, here's the thing I want you to understand. God can take it. And you know, so many times, my goodness, yeah, we, we got that anger and then we put on the mask of, of uh, or we put the fear mask that comes out in anger on us and we go to social media and just, ah, 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 ah. everybody's an idiot. Ah, ah. This president's dumb, and that president's dumb. And, blah, 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 blah. and we just, and if you like, oh, you're an idiot. And we just blow everybody out, right? It just really helps the world. It just re reaches people from Jesus all day long. We just spew there. And I understand, some, it's okay to be angry. Moses gets, got ticked off. You know the one time he got ticked off and lashed out in public? Wasn't a good thing. You remember that? Hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock? Mm. But you know what Moses had a habit of doing most of his life? He's angry. He's afraid and he's angry. What does he do? He runs to God. He senses he needs to control something. He goes to God. 
He's got all these different masks that he puts on, but he goes to God, and God can handle your mask when you go to him. And I'm telling you, it's in that place of being with God. You may have to stay there for a long time, but being in God's presence, has it does miracles for the fear that comes over us. In a world of a million fears, there's one shelter to run to. And then lastly, and I'm done today, in a world of a million paths, there's one God to follow. When Israel left Egypt, there were multiple directions that they could have gone. But God didn't leave it up to Moses for them to figure out, did he? Exodus 13, verse 21 says this, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. Verse 22, And he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. Listen, there were a million directions that Moses could have went. You imagine leaving Egypt and not having a GPS? Well... It's all wide open, right? There's a million places that he could have went, but Moses didn't need to know the exact place to take. He didn't need to understand how to navigate with the stars or, or have this great degree in, you know, in the, in understanding maps and all these things. He didn't need to have that. All Moses needed to do was stay close to the cloud and follow him. That's it. He really didn't have a million options to figure out. He just had one choice to make. Am I going to follow the cloud or not? It narrowed it down. It was really that simple. When the cloud stopped, he stopped. When the cloud moved, he moved. When the cloud went left, he went left. When the cloud went right, he went right. There was one decision to make. Follow the cloud or not. Follow God or not. And I think most of us are in some season of confusion right now. What job am I supposed to take? Do I stay here? Do I move somewhere else? We got all of these decisions. What's our economy going to be like? What's, you know, do I retire now? Do I not retire? All of these decisions, that just be- it becomes overwhelming, doesn't it? When you're trying to figure it out and you don't have all the information that you need. And there are a million paths to take. But what if, what if 2021 is not so much about finding the right path, the right job, the right decision, the right, you fill in the blank. What if it's about following the right guide? What if you narrow down a million decisions to one? So, Pastor, you're oversimplifying this. I don't think I am. I think we spend a lot of our time, and effort, trying to figure out a year from now. God says, I, n- I need you to figure out right now And that decision is to follow me. Follow me, let me be your guide. What if it's about us saying, I'm going to stop worrying about what choice I make a year from now. Instead, I'm going to focus my attention on getting close to God. I don't know the right path to take, but He does. I don't know when to stop and when to press forward, but He does. And in this season where everything is unclear, I'm going to get clear on one thing. My view of God. He tells me to go, I'll go. If he tells me to stop, I'll stop. And I wonder for you, maybe this last year and a half has been incredibly difficult, and it has for all of us. Maybe you're just still in this fog of being unclear, and and you're about to drive yourself crazy because you can't figure it out. And today, I'm telling you, you don't have to. You need to narrow down a million decisions to one God to follow. Pastor, does that mean he's going to answer all of my questions tomorrow? No, that's not what that means. He didn't do that for Moses. But he said, Moses, every day when you get up, I'm going to be right here. And every day when you get up, you got another choice to make. You're going to follow me? Then let's go. You know what's amazing is that strategy worked, didn't it? Moses never did figure out how to read maps. He never did figure out any of those things. But he learned how to follow God. Man, formed a country from that. We're still feeling the ripple effects from it to this day. And so I wonder about you today. Has your life been unclear? World full of a million opinions. There's one truth. In a world of a million fears, there's one shelter. In a world full of a million paths, there's one guy. His name's Jesus Christ. And church, I, I don't know about you. I, I'm telling you, I needed this this year. I needed this 
being in the middle of a pandemic, trying to lead a church in a city, just meeting in a soccer field. God I'm trying to figure all these things out. And I felt like this is the word he gave me. Uh-uh. You just follow me. Just follow me. Church, today I'm just saying, just follow me. In a world of a million voices, there's one. There's one to listen to. His name is Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. God, we love you. God, we are thankful for your son, Jesus. We don't know how to sum him up. He's so many things. We're thankful today he is, he is the embodiment of truth. We're not the first culture to try to grapple with and understand what truth is. God, throughout history, your word has been a source of truth for us. May we go back to that today. And God, you have been a, a shelter for us over the past year and a half. God, you have been, you've been a guide. May we continue to follow you. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the way that they have saw beyond themselves. And God, they've invested to grow your kingdom all across the country in California. And Lord, I thank you for how that's multiplied into other disciples. And God, now other churches. Lord, I pray you continue to bless new life and its people. May they continue to plant seeds all around the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. You're here today and you say, Preacher, I needed to hear that message and God spoke to my heart. If that's you, would you say, Preacher, pray for me. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Just lift it up right now. Lift it up with these. Just hands all over. Can we do this just in this moment? If God spoke to your heart, would you just spend a moment with me? Just gather around this altar real quick. Come with these that are coming and just say, Lord, I need to keep my eyes focused on you. When I need direction, God, help me just to see you. And Lord, when I, when I need comfort, help me just to run to you. And when I need wisdom, God, help me to just run to you. He's there. So as these pray, and as you pray there at your seat, let God do his work. again we thank you so much Lord today that you are truth and Lord that we can follow you knowing that Lord you will never fail you will never falter there's no shadow of turning with you Lord help us when we are weak Lord help us when we fear Lord when we struggle Lord help us to follow follow you Lord, I love what your word says in the book of Psalms. It says, I have chosen the way of truth. I have set your judgments before me. God, help us each and every day to set your word in front of us. God, so that you are our guide. And so that we can follow you every step of the way. Lord, be with us as we're making decisions for you. Help us to follow through with those decisions, and may we just trust you. 
Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Um, we're getting ready to have a really great part of our service. One of my favorite things to be a part of is baptism. And uh, before we do that, we want to take up a love offering for Brother Stephen and his family. And uh, this is to offset the costs of their travel expenses. Um, they traveled a long way to get here and to be here and to uh, preach at several churches. And we're so thankful that they did. Um, but this is also just to pour out our love for them and what they're doing in California. Family that is so near and dear to so many of us, to our hearts. Uh, I, I can think back on days whenever I was in college and, and Brother Stephen, you were still here and he came to some of our classes at times and he would teach and some of the, a lot of the wisdom that I gained from uh, his experience here at New Life Church and just from his relationship with the Lord, things that I got to see in him that I wanted to emulate and um, I'm so thankful for him, his family, his wife, his kids, all of them and we want to be a blessing to them. So uh, dig deep and let's give to this precious family. W would you bow for a word of prayer? Lord, we love you and we thank you so much, Lord, for this family. Thank you for the ministry uh, that they are a part of. Thank you for their church that is growing, it's moving forward. And Lord, we pray once again that we can be a blessing to them. Help us to just open our hearts for what you are doing. God, the gospel is so precious. We thank you for what the gospel has done in our hearts. But Lord, you want to do so much more all across the globe. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would give today. Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> service amen and uh, I can't think of a better way to finish it up than to uh, have uh, some baptisms uh, today and so uh, that just represents the fact that Jesus is still in the saving business amen church so we've got a few we're going to baptize this morning all right all right this is Jackson Jackson Mayors, of course, uh, Michael and Ashley, they're back here taking pictures and video, and, and we love this family. Jackson gave his heart to the Lord sometime back, and he's been asking questions about baptism, and, and I've met with him, gave uh, Michael and Ashley a pamphlet to kind of go through with him to try to answer some of the questions that he may have, and, and we all feel really good about not only his understanding of salvation, but also baptism and what it means. Baptism is a testimony. This is just a picture of what Jesus Christ has already done in the hearts of these who will be baptized today. And so he's come today, wanted to be baptized. Would you pray with me and ask God's blessing on his life? Father, thank you so much for Jackson. Lord, thank you for his eagerness and willingness to obey. Now bless him as we baptize him, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jackson, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is Sadie. Uh, Sadie has been coming to our church now for a little while. We'll get a chance today to baptize her sister and her mom. 
and um, we, we met um, today and uh, again just made sure that, that she understood uh, what baptism was, understood salvation. I love what Brother Stephen said today, salvation is not just a prayer, it is a decision to follow and obey Jesus. And uh, she has done that and today she wants to come and as a testimony she wants to be baptized. And so let's pray and ask God's blessing on Sadie's life. Father, thank you. Uh, for Sadie, Lord, thank you for her, her dear family. Uh, God, I thank you so much that you said in your word, suffer the little children to come unto me. And so, God, thank you for saving uh, young people. God, thank you for saving them from so much of the world. And now, God, we pray you'll use her in a mighty way. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sadie, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Hey, this is uh, the, the older sister, the big sister, the mean sister. What did you tell me to say? <laughs> no, this is uh, her sweet sister, Hayden. She, along with her sister, we met again today, and, and uh, she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And, and church, I want to say, uh, let us never get weary in seeing young people come to Christ. And so this is, this is where Jesus, I believe, uh, does maybe the most transforming work because he has an entire life to use. And so uh, we thank the Lord for uh, Hayden's obedience today. So let's pray together. Father, we do ask your blessing on Hayden's life. Lord, we ask you now that this would be just one of so many acts of obedience to you. And so bless her and her family, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hayden, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is Brittany. This is Mama. And uh, Brittany got saved some time back, and uh, it's been good to see her again. And what a joy it is to get baptized with your daughters and, uh, and to have your family here. And um, we're just so thankful for her and what God is doing in her life, and pray God will continue to grow her into the, the young lady that God has saved her to be. So would you pray with me one more time? Father, thank you for Brittany. Lord, thank you for the privilege to baptize her family. And uh, Lord, I pray now that you will bless her as a mom. I pray that you'll bless her as a Christian. And God, may she just dedicate her life to obeying you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Brittany, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. Amen, church. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you so much for being here. Let me give you a, a few announcements. We have a lot of stuff going on in the next, in the next six weeks, okay? Um, this week, we have a big-time work week here on campus, so if you're at home twiddling your thumbs, call me. Uh, we have work for you to do, and so every day we're going to be doing projects. You can call before you come. We'll let you know kind of what to prepare for, and so help us out with that uh, if you can. Um, we also have our 4th of July, uh, next Sunday night, we have life groups tonight, but next Sunday night, we're having all of our life groups come together. We want to use it as an outreach. We're going to have at 5 o'clock, we're going to grill out hamburgers and hot dogs and have different games set up and just have a really good time on Sunday, uh, July the 4th. And so we want to invite you and we want to encourage you to invite somebody. Now, if you invite somebody, the church is going to provide all the hamburgers and hot dogs you need to provide all the sides, but make sure that uh, you let us know if you got somebody coming. And uh, even if they come last minute, that's okay. We just want to really pack the gym and pack the fellowship hall out. It's going to be a great, uh, great evening. 
A junior camp is July the 5th through the 9th, and so see Brother Matt if you have any questions about junior camp. July the 11th, we have a, a new family lunch, and if you are new to our church, if you've never taken my church 242 class, if you've never joined our church, we want you to come to that lunch, and I'm going to feed you for free. For free. All right? So you come, okay, and uh, let, give us an opportunity just to fellowship and tell you a little bit about our church. Uh, that's going to be a great time. That'll be after the 11 o'clock service on July the 11th. Uh, and then we have uh, Love Loud's going to be July the 31st. Uh, we have God's Man, which is going to be August 6th and 7th. And before we know it, school's going to start back. And so everybody say, oh, me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but let's just keep praying for each other, and let's keep living for the Lord. He is worthy. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Parents, if you have anybody going to junior camp, I'm going to have a quick meeting right here. Parents of those going to junior camp, meeting right here.